The Titanic's Final Meal The RMS Titanic is probably the most famous ship ever to sail on the seven seas. The glamorous British ocean liner departed on her maiden voyage from Southampton on April 10, 1912. She was the absolute height of luxury, sporting lavishly appointed staterooms, lounges, reading and smoking rooms, a swimming pool, and a gymnasium with the latest exercise machines, and of course an elegant first-class dining room and that iconic grand staircase. And with all those sumptuous surroundings, the first-class passengers certainly weren't eating hardtack. In fact, the Titanic set sail during the Edwardian era, named for King Edward VII of the UK, a time in which lavish food in bountiful quantities was the hallmark of wealth and a cornerstone of high society. Though King Edward had died of a double heart attack in 1910, the era and its opulent dining continued until the outbreak of World War I in 1918. French chef Auguste Escoffier of the Savoy Hotel in London popularized continental cuisine in the UK. King Edward dined frequently at the Savoy with a number of different glamorous mistresses. And where the king went, so went the upper class. Brits who had long disdained the garlic-eating French were now mad for foie gras, volavon, and peach melba. Nouveau riche Americans were eager to adopt the customs of the established aristocracy of Europe, so quickly followed suit. Haute cuisine, or high cooking, became more than just sustenance. It was entertainment and a way of life. The upper class always dressed to the nines for dinner and indulged in extravagant, multi-course, hours-long meals. The Titanic's head chef, Charles Proctor, was the second highest paid staff member after the captain, and he managed 62 galley and kitchen workers, including chefs, cooks, bakers, butchers, and scullions. They prepared nearly 6,000 meals a day. The first-class dining room served 500 diners a new menu every night. The massive refrigerators on G-Deck were the height of modernity and carried around 85 tons of meat and seafood. It is no surprise, then, that the 11-course dinner served on the evening before the Titanic sank was one for the ages. So put on your best white tie and tails or your most elegant beaded evening gown. Saunter down the grand staircase and take your seat next to John Jacob Astor or the unsinkable Molly Brown as we enjoy the lavish meal served to first-class diners on the Titanic's final night above the waves. As guests assembled in the dining room, pre-dinner cocktails were served, a concession to the Americans on board who enjoyed this new fashion. Europeans thought cocktails ruined your appetite for dinner. Though the actual recipes used on the Titanic went down with the ship, Many food historians and chefs have since recreated this famous menu based on popular recipes of the era. The 1911 bar menu of the Olympic, the Titanic's sister ship, included popular cocktails of the day, such as the Manhattan, whiskey, sweet vermouth, bitters, and a maraschino cherry, Tom Collins, gin, lemon juice, simple syrup, club soda, and a lemon twist, and John Collins, same as a Tom, but with bourbon instead of gin, and a maraschino cherry. First course, hors d'oeuvres, oysters. Dinner began around 7 o'clock, just as the sun was setting on the Titanic for the final time. A glass of champagne launched the meal, along with canapé à la mirale, shrimp butter on toast topped with a butter poached shrimp and a dollop of caviar. Caviar, salt-cured sturgeon eggs, is one of the oldest delicacies in the world. It was coveted by the ancient Greeks and Romans and thought to improve mood and work as an aphrodisiac. The Edwardians considered Russian caviar superior. The hors d'oeuvres course also included oysters. This saltwater shellfish has been a common food since ancient humans first reached the coast. Lascivious Greeks and Romans also considered oysters an aphrodisiac. In the 18th and 19th centuries, oyster farming surged, making the bivalve an affordable protein for the working class. New York Harbor was one of the top producers of oysters, and street carts selling raw and cooked oysters were as common as hot dog carts are now. All those shells piled up, and Pearl Street on Manhattan was actually paved with oyster shells. 
But by the early 20th century, pollution and overharvesting depleted the stock, and the oyster beds in New York Harbor died out. By the Titanic's launch, oysters were back to being a rarefied food for the rich. The oysters were likely served a la russe, raw with a topping of diced tomatoes, vodka, lemon juice, and horseradish. Second course, consume Olga, cream of barley. The soup course, an obligatory part of any Edwardian dinner, was a choice of two. Consume Olga, a clear veal and vegetable stock enriched with egg whites and laced with port wine, served with slices of sea scallop, celery bulb, and English cucumber. Russian-inspired dishes were especially popular among the Edwardians, owing to the grandeur of the Russian aristocracy, particularly the Romanov royal family. Tsar Nicholas II and his wife Alexandra were both first cousins of King George V of the UK. Hearty cream of barley soup was chicken stock made with merpois, that's carrots, onions, and celery, and enriched with egg yolks and pearl barley. It was seasoned with nutmeg and fresh parsley and garnished with fried bread croutons. All of the courses were paired with wine. Though the Titanic's wine list was never recovered, we can assume that it was fine and extensive. One report suggests that the ship carried over 70 types of champagne. Diners were likely served French reds with meat courses and German whites with seafood. The Edwardian palate veered towards sweeter wines than we prefer today. Third course, poached salmon with mousseline sauce, cucumbers. This fish course was a signature dish of the White Star Line and was served aboard many of their luxury liners. It had also been served for the celebratory lunch at the Grand Central Hotel in Belfast following the launch of the Titanic the previous May. The fresh salmon was poached in basic court bouillon made of white wine and aromatics. It was served with thinly sliced English cucumbers, sprigs of fresh dill, and a rich and creamy mousseline sauce made of butter, egg yolk, lemon, and cream. Fourth course, filet mignon lily, saute of chicken lyonnaise, vegetable marrow farsi. Enough messing about. Now we get to the genuine Edwardian largesse. A fine cut of beef with a rich, decadent sauce and two of the showiest ingredients of the time. Foie gras and black truffles. Black truffles are rare and notoriously difficult to farm. They are usually foraged and are therefore one of the most expensive edible mushrooms in the world, at around $2,500 a pound today. Edwardian diners prize this unique flavor and its price tag. The filet mignon lily was sautéed in butter and served with artichoke hearts, foie gras, and black truffles, and a rich reduced pan sauce of more butter, tomato, rosemary, and cognac. This expensive cut of tender steak was laid over potatoes anna, thinly sliced and filled with butter. For those preferring white meat, sauté of chicken lyonnaise could be selected. This classic French dish was an Escoffier recipe. Sautéed chicken breast served with caramelized onions and a white wine and tomato sauce. For vegetarians, and there certainly would have been a few, vegetarianism having been a relatively new craze among the upper class, especially among suffragettes who wished to escape the constant onslaught of rich, fattening foods. A vegetable marrow farsi was on offer. A marrow is the English word for a zucchini. As they were normally only available in summer, marrow grown in a greenhouse for the April voyage of the Titanic would have been an extravagance. The marrow was stuffed with rice, mushrooms, fresh basil, and Parmesan cheese. Veganism really wasn't a thing back then. Fifth course, lamb, mint sauce, roast duckling, applesauce, sirloin of beef, chateau potatoes, green peas, creamed carrots, boiled rice, parmentier, and boiled new potatoes. I hope you're hungry. Now we get to the main course of the meal. Lamb with mint sauce is a traditional British meal to serve at Easter. As the Titanic sailed just a few days after Easter, this was a very fitting menu selection. The roasted leg of lamb was served with a sauce made of fresh mint, white wine, cider vinegar, and shallots. 
Glazed roast duckling was also available served with a savory applesauce made with shallots and vinegar. The third option, sirloin of beef, yet another expensive and tender cut, was served with chateau potatoes, which were cut into oval shapes to look like jewels, and roasted with fresh parsley and copious quantities of butter. The side dishes served with the main course were peas, carrots, rice, and potatoes. But they certainly weren't your typical cafeteria slop. Peas were served in a tombal, mashed with eggs, cream, and mint to pair with the lamb, and cooked in a drum-shaped mold. The creamed carrots were julienned and cooked with cinnamon, nutmeg, whipping cream, chives, and of course, butter. 18th century French medical activist Anton Augustine Parmentier elevated the humble potato to a fine dining food. Before this time, potatoes were seen as pig feed and suspected to cause leprosy. Potatoes Parmentier, named for him, were diced and pan fried in a cup of butter. Sixth course Punch Romaine. This was a palate cleanser after the heavier courses. This custom was championed by Escoffier to help diners make it through the marathon meal. Punch Romaine consisted of shaved ice with simple syrup, champagne, white rum, and fresh squeezed orange and lemon juice served with a citrus twist. Ah, refreshing. Seventh course, roast squab and cress. Squab, or young pigeon, has been a popular and affordable protein in the Middle East for centuries and is mentioned in the Bible. It was a food of the nobility in medieval Europe and continues to be a popular staple in French cooking today. On the Titanic, it was wrapped in slices of bacon and roasted with garlic and fresh marjoram, served with a pan reduction sauce of Madeira wine and a salad of fresh watercress. The squab was carved and served tableside as a dining spectacle that was a crowd pleaser for the Edwardians. Eighth course, cold asparagus vinaigrette. Cooked asparagus was served chilled with an opulent vinaigrette made with champagne and saffron, the most expensive spice in the world. Saffron originated in Iran and is the vivid crimson stigma of the saffron crocus flower. It has been used through the ages as a paint color, textile dye, and cosmetic. In the 14th century, saffron was believed to be a cure for the Black Plague, and piracy of the precious spice was rampant. The theft of a shipment even led to the 14-week Saffron War in the Mediterranean. By the Edwardian era, saffron was primarily used as a food seasoning for the wealthy to show off. Ninth course, pâté de foie gras, celery. Foie gras, the liver of a fattened goose or duck, was first enjoyed by the Egyptians in 2500 BC and then by the wealthy Romans. In the Middle Ages, eating poultry liver fell out of fashion. However, kosher dietary law prohibited the use of many cooking fats commonly available in Western Europe, such as butter and bacon. Jews living there relied on poultry fat or schmaltz for cooking and fattened their flocks to produce it. They appreciated the delicate taste of fattened goose liver and preserved this cooking tradition. In the Renaissance, gastronomes began to venture into the Jewish ghettos in order to buy poultry livers. By the Edwardian era, foie gras was a staple indulgent ingredient at upper-class tables. On the Titanic, it was served room temperature on toast with celery. Tenth course, Waldorf pudding, peaches in chartreuse jelly, chocolate and vanilla eclairs, French ice cream. The dessert course brought another opportunity for choice. Waldorf pudding, named for the lauded Waldorf Hotel in New York City, was a baked custard made with apples, raisins, ginger, and walnuts. Peaches in chartreuse jelly was a real show-off dish. Jellies, gelatins, or jello as we call it in the States, was a popular spectacle dessert in the Victorian era. They were molded into elaborate shapes and tableaus that were aimed to impress. Owing to the need for expensive refrigeration and the likelihood of collapsed jelly disasters, this dessert continued to be a signature course that could make or break the reputation of a society hostess and her cook into the Edwardian era. 
Chartreuse is a French liqueur with a distinct bright green color and an herbal flavor. It has been made only by Carthusian monks since 1737. Only three monks at any time know the recipe. And peaches, another summer fruit, poached with cinnamon and cloves would have been quite a luxury in April. Even more offerings to satisfy the sweet tooth included chocolate vanilla eclairs, a popular French pastry made with delicate choux dough filled with vanilla cream and topped with chocolate icing, and French ice cream, Though now we think of ice cream as a rather pedestrian dessert, for much of its history it was the height of luxury, mostly owing to the need to keep it cold, which was very expensive prior to the advent of refrigerators. Queen Marie Antoinette was fond of the cold confection, and First Lady Dolly Madison served ice cream at the White House in 1810 to much acclaim. Her favorite flavor, oyster. By the 1910s, ice cream was more widely available, but still had a whiff of upper-class sophistication. Cheese course. As a traditional end to French dinners, a course of cheese, fresh fruit, and jam was served. The final course of the night was delivered around 11.30 p.m., and diners would often linger over it, enjoying conversation and drinks well into the night. Cheeses served on the last night of the Titanic include Emmental, more commonly known as Swiss cheese, Edam, a semi-hard cheese from the Netherlands, and Stilton, a strong-flavored English blue cheese. At 11.40 p.m., the Titanic struck an iceberg, ripping open five of her watertight compartments. Many passengers were still enjoying the final courses, cigars, and after-dinner drinks, including Madeira wine and port. Some reported having felt a slight shudder at the moment of impact, but few suspected the imminent doom and continued to drink and converse. But very quickly, it became clear that the ship was in serious trouble. While passengers were scrambling for lifeboats, American business tycoon Benjamin Guggenheim retired with his valet to the first-class smoking room to await death like a gentleman. Tragically, 1,517 people lost their lives in the mid-Atlantic that night. Nearly all of the kitchen staff who had made that astonishing meal, including Chef Charles Proctor, went down with the ship. Though one baker, Charles Joggin, notably survived and had the foresight to throw deck chairs into the water for passengers to use as flotation devices. First-class passengers had the highest survival rate which was still only 62%. At least those who lost their lives on that fateful night went down after a truly spectacular meal. Special thanks to Chef Connor McClelland, who recreates the Titanic's final dinner at the Rayanne House in Belfast, Ireland and food historian Pamela Foster of DowntonAbbeyCooks.com, where you can find many of these fantastic recipes if you are bold enough to cook your own Titanic-inspired meal. Links are in the description. If you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, comment your thoughts, and check out my other royal history videos. If you really want to help, please consider supporting me on Patreon. A link is in the description. Thank you for watching.